So thank you all for being here today. Um, I'm going to be presenting uh, with uh, my colleague Raymond Tuhawks on decolonizing the classroom. Uh, Ray is the, uh, the Quetzal of the Mashapog Nahaganza Chiefdom. He's executive director of the Providence Cultural Equity Initiative, and he's also a, a Juris Doctorate candidate at our own law school. Ray, did I get that? Um, did I get that date right for your graduation? I'm not sure. He Yes. Wait, no, no. Yes. 22. Okay. 20, yeah, 22. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. That's good to know. Um, you know, Ray will have a chance to tell you a lot more about himself and his work here in a moment. So I'll be turning over the stage to him. But I kind of wanted to give you a little bit of backstory about how we connected um, as an entry point into kind of maybe the partnership we're going to talk a little bit about today. Um, and, uh, and what I hope is what we're going to be doing here is kind of extending an invitation to to all of you to think about ways that um, maybe you can um, take up a sort of more community engaged sort of teaching approach here um, as you sort of deepen your interest and experience um, in sort of indigenizing the curriculum. But at the same time, um, I wanna give you maybe just some ways in which you can plug into current issues and conversations without maybe having to uh, dive in head first, so to speak, right, into a big community engagement project. Um, for Ray and I, this really started um, a year ago, I guess it seems like so much longer ago, but it was maybe a little bit over a year ago that I had approached uh, Charlotte Carrington Farmer um, asking about whether or not we had done any work to develop an indigenous land acknowledgement that I could include in scholarship that I was publishing. Um, and Charlotte said, um, no, but you should talk to uh, Ray and his colleague Ty and see maybe if they can get you started in the right, um, on the right process here. Um, in that conversation, we immediately hit it off because I think we were we were talking. We're, we're both big thinkers, I think, and that's what helps, right? Like that, we immediately thinking, well, landing acknowledgement, great, but how are we using that as sort of the tip of a spear point? We're really looking at not just like institutional transformation, but transformation at the municipal and state levels as well too. How do we really grow this into a big project? So the land acknowledgement started off as how do we get the language right? And we're able to pull in people like. Uh, the Sagamore and Loren to really help us craft this into something we we're going to be proud of. And that really grew into a bigger idea, um, which we've begun to call uh, using an uh, Eastern Algonquian term, uh, Wuchewame. And so that's the living cultural collaborative that we're really planning on uh, sort of developing out of this work. And I won't go into too much more detail there, but what I will say is that um, a lot of this is not something that we're just inventing in the last year. It's really growing out of, I think, the, uh, the, um, the imagination and the hard work that um, Ray has already been doing through his own nonprofit um, in the community. And that's what I hope that Ray's gonna be able to maybe speak to, sort of the, um, the, the ethics, the vision of that project, um, and as a way of really thinking, how can we sort of sync our own work with work that's already being done in the community? Um, and with that, Ray, um, I'm hoping you can you can take it away. Uh, so first of all, with Wusanitham Park, good day, friends. Tyler Rand, good to see you as always. Um, and excited to be here uh, today, just sharing a little bit about the Providence Cultural Equity Initiative um, and the work that we're doing uh, that focuses on changing how the story of Rhode Island is told and sold. Uh, so we can go to the next slide, Brian. Uh, so the Providence Cultural Equity Initiative promotes, cultivates, and advocates for the cultural sector and economy of Rhode Island. This is work that um, naturally I had gotten involved in just trying to learn more about myself and who my people were and what our experiences and heritage has been here in Rhode Island, and in particular in Providence, uh, realizing that there were so many other people who didn't come from indigenous backgrounds here in the Americas who come from all over the place but who are doing the same. So we have large Southeast Asian populations here in Providence. We have a lot of Latino or Latinx populations here in Providence. We have a lot of populations from West Africa and other areas over in that region. Uh, but what I found was that all of them valued, promoted, supported, um, held it very important, their culture and their cultural identity. And I thought, wow, this is really important work um, and someone should be kind of focusing on this and that's really where the, the, the uh, sort of work that the Providence Cultural Equity Initiative uh, does comes from, that this natural progression of my understanding the importance of culture and seeing how it's embraced by everyone else and wanting to formalize my efforts and energy in that regard. Next slide, please, Brian. 
Uh, so about PCI, we were established through a Carter Innovation Fellowship from the Rhode Island Foundation in May of 2016. Uh, with that fellowship, I was charged with cultivating Rhode Island's cultural sector and economy by promoting the state's cultural history, heritage, and diversity. And it's so key. Um, this was around the same time when Rhode Island was, was trying to come up with a new uh, marketing uh, program or initiative for tourism. And uh, the, the end product was Rhode Island, warmer and cooler. And it was just like, this is outrageous. Uh, the state has so much more to offer than just that. And, and the real uh, purpose or thought was culture should be that thing that the state is offering because that's what the basis of it was when the state was formed. Uh, when Roger Williams came across, it was an exchange of culture that allowed him to get started here. And that should be kind of the, the calling card of the state. So, and then finally, we were incorporated as a Rhode Island uh, domestic nonprofit in 2018. Uh, next slide, Brian, that's fine. Our mission is to steward and ambassador Rhode Island's cultural sector and economy. And our vision is to transform Rhode Island into New England's premier cultural hub. Uh, we think Rhode Island is it when you're talking culture uh, in the state and in particular here in Providence. And I'll speak to Providence because that's where I'm from. Um, you could pretty much somewhere in the city find someone from anywhere in any part of the world. And that's something fantastic, especially on a scale uh, such as we have here. So next slide, please. And of course, our value proposition with that mission and vision is changing how the story of Rhode Island is told and sold. And um, this is because Rhode Island has a tendency to be presented as this small thing. And uh, when we get into the real revolution 2036, we'll talk about why Rhode Island should really be viewed as sort of uh, pivotal and, and fundamental to how we view and engage with each other in contemporary society in the world. So next slide, please. So our products and services focus in three areas. First is cultural economy. This is where we focus on cultural tourism cultural placemaking, which takes the placemaking sort of concept where you find a space that doesn't really have anything going on with it. You usually put some art or something there that draws people to that space and now you've placemaked there. And what we say in PCEI is, well, that's cool, but we think that the place that you're making, there should be some sort of narrative that ties it to the space that it's actually in. So it's not just about the art piece that's there, but it's about where that specific land area is and that art piece representing the narrative or experience of that place. We call it cultural placemaking. And then festival and event curation, management, and support, which I've been doing for a, a number of years. Uh, second area is cultural equity. Uh, we, we chartered an institute for social cohesion, which gives social cohesion workshops and certifications, one in particular around racism and getting a comprehensive understanding of it and how you address it. Uh, also, nonviolence and reconciliation workshops and certifications, and then cultural engagement and education, which is why I'm here today, part of that sort of element. And then lastly, cultural consulting, dealing with cultural relationship building, cultural asset and assessment and advisement, and then marketing, promotion, and branding. I'll talk a little bit about that later on. But ultimately, when we combine these three elements, we say that we're in the business of cultural development. Next slide, please. So what is culture? Because if we're going to have a conversation around cultural equity and the Providence Cultural Equity Initiative and Wuchi Wami Living Culture Collaborative, we should have an understanding of what culture is. And this was defined by Hofstede in 1997. Uh, he defined it as the cumulative deposit of knowledge, experience, beliefs, values, attitudes, meanings, hierarchies, religion, notions of time, roles, spatial relations, concepts of the universe, and material objects and possessions acquired by a group of people in the course of generations through individual and group striving. If any of you are familiar with Teotihuacan, you will see to the right there, the fantastic, what is contemporarily known as the Pyramid of the Sun. And this was a trip that we took when I got the fellowship, um, innovation fellowship, uh, to learn more about how they do culture and cultural tourism in other parts of the world. So we took a trip down there and that was a very nice picture that I took when I was there. Next slide, please. Uh, so what is culture? Once again, it's art, food, heritage, history, music, traditions. This is Caldo in Mexico City. They had these tents set up and uh, Caldo, or what we would call a form of chicken soup, is a traditional meal down there in Mexico City. So there I am enjoying it with my, my lovely wife on our trip. Next slide, please. But how we define culture in uh, PCEI is the way in which and the reason why things are done. So when we're talking about culture, we're talking about the way they're done, but not just the way they're done, the reasons why they're done that way. Because in any culture, whenever you see them doing something, be it 
the clothing that they wear, the food that they eat, um, how they engage with each other, how they get married, all of those sorts of things, there's a way that they do it. And then there's a reason why they do those things. And if we don't take the time to understand both of those elements, it can lead to a lot of damage on so many different levels. Uh, so that's how we define culture, the way in which and the reason why things are done. And to the right, uh, we went to the National Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City. There are so many different indigenous cultures in Mexico. I was blown away because I didn't know how many they were there. And this was just one of the styles of regalia that one of those cultures where um, the name escapes me at the moment. I will make sure to research that. So the next time I do this, I can give that information as well. Next slide, please. So why is culture important? And this is from our creative diversity. This is a report by the World Commission on Culture and Development. Yes, there's a World Commission on Culture and Development. Their summary version from 1996. They said, we aim to have shown them how culture shapes our thinking, imagining, and behavior. It is the transmission of behavior as well as a dynamic source for change, creativity, freedom, and the awakening of innovative opportunities. For groups and societies, culture is energy, inspiration, and empowerment, as well as the knowledge and acknowledgement of diversity. Just as in the task of building peace and consolidating democratic values, an indivisible set of goals, so too economic and political rights cannot be realized separately from social and cultural. So as you can see, they're basically saying that nothing can get done or nothing has gotten done without some relation or through some lens of culture. Your culture informs why you do it, how you do it, when you're going to do it, who's going to do it. These all come out of cultural understandings, cultural values, cultural norms. And to the right is a picture of some artwork when we were at the Yakataz uh, for the um, Kurepecha people, which my wife, uh, her people have connections to, which is in Michoacan um, in Morelia, outside of Michoacan, outside of Morelia in Michoacan, I'm sorry. And once again, just the diversity of uh, cultures in Mexico, the Purepecha, if I could just for an aside for a moment, were there before the Aztecs arrived, warred with the Aztecs, uh, could not be beaten by the Aztecs and eventually turned into trading partners with the Aztecs and they deal specifically in copper. Uh, and I didn't even know they existed. I actually told my wife when she told me her people were Purepecha that she didn't know what she was talking about. And that was before I was getting a little bit more acculturated. So that was just some of the artwork there and we can go to the next slide. So once again, with PCEI, we say, why is culture important? Well, because culture impacts every aspect of our existence and livelihood. So our existence is what we've been through to get us to this point, and our livelihood is what we're doing right now to make sure that we stay alive and continue to the future. And to the right, these are some different chiefs who were prevalent in the Algonquin Indian Council. This was the early 20th century. Uh, very much active in the northern part of the state of Rhode Island, specifically in Providence. The gentleman on the left in the very elaborate white headdress is my great, great, great uncle, Chief Edward Michael, uh, Chief Sunset, who lived right here in Providence. And once again, during that time period, they were doing their best to keep the culture alive, to keep the community together, and to connect with the other nations to make sure that although we were coming from different bloodlines, we all acknowledged and respected the shared experience we have and we're working together to move forward. Next slide, please. What's, what is cultural equity? Um, and on the left, uh, this is from Mexico City. This was a picture of some artwork they had done, sculpture and monumentalism. On the right is an Aztec, it might have been Montezuma. And on the left is a Spanish conquistador. So what I found in Mexico City was they did a great job and probably they could do it better, and I'm sure that they have their issues when you get down into nuts and bolts of it from an outsider looking at it. Wow, this is fantastic. They're acknowledging both their indigenous heritage and their colonial history. So what is cultural equity? Well, it's ensuring that the expressions of diverse cultural communities and their cultural practitioners are protected and supported in a fair and equitable manner. Um, just looking here in Rhode Island, what you'll see is a lot of the left, the conquistador, but you won't see anything about the Montezuma here in Rhode Island. And that's not a very equitable situation. So we're saying there needs to be more cultural equity, hence the Providence Cultural Equity Initiative. Next slide, please. And what is cultural equity? Well, it's a means of protecting history and heritage while simultaneously using these elements to positively impact the present and future 
And this is a picture from a couple months ago with the big 10,000 person uh, march and rally that was here in Providence uh, for, for social justice and around the situation that took place with George Floyd. Um, and this was us down there representing for indigenous folks. And as you can see, although it was a Black Lives Matter protest, American Indians are for justice. So we stand in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement. And this was just, just doing our part to promote cultural equity. We're here, we're sharing our culture, history, and heritage, but we're doing it to positively impact the present and the future. Next slide, please. And this is ultimately the real work that PCEI does, this concept we call living culture, which we define as the acknowledgement, respect, and celebration of culture as a consistent, viable, and influential element of daily life. This was me um, and some other warriors uh, from local tribes at the um, Natick, uh, Massachusetts powwow. The Natick's are actually the tribe that wrote the Algonquin Indian Bible with John Eliot. And they're still alive and well up in Massachusetts. Uh, but most people think the Massachusetts are all extinct. So we were up there supporting. And as you can see, this was two, three years ago. So, you know, we're doing our best to dress like we're back in the 15 and 1600s. But then we're gonna come out of that and put jeans on. And instead of riding our horse, we're gonna get into our car that has many horses under the hood. Um, and we're doing our best to keep our culture alive today. So it's living. Um, it's not something that was in the past. It's alive in here today. And uh, by the simple fact that I speak and breathe, my culture has persisted and exists right now. So next slide, please. So when we're talking living culture, we're talking cultural communities. Uh, whatever those may be here in Rhode Island, if you're talking the Indian side, it's tribes. Uh, but then there are communities, but then you have West African communities and break those down as Nigerian, Liberian, people from Ghana, from Cape Verde. Uh, you have, you know, Southeast Asian communities, Cambodian, Laotian. You also have larger Asian communities, a large Chinese population. And when you get into Latinx, you have uh, Dominicans, you have Puerto Ricans, you have Guatemalans, you have Mexicans. So there's all of these different cultural communities and you can't lump them all in together. You have to deal with them individually. You can get some general understandings of them, but you have to deal with them individually. Coming out of those communities, you have cultural practitioners, those who share the traditions and the uh, practices of their people as they have been taught to them. So this is a lot of times where you get um, even a knowledge that these communities exist or alive because you might not bump into them on a regular basis. And this picture here is from the first PVD Fest. And as you can see here, there's several different cultures represented in this one picture right here. Um, and how beautiful, once again, one of the highlights of Providence for me. Uh, outside of that, you have your cultural supporters. Um, and that's what I like to look at our family here at Roger Williams University about. You're not from these communities. You're not one of these practitioners. But you know what they offer is important and beneficial. So you want to know how you can tie your work and your efforts into support and raise that voice. And then you have your cultural enthusiasts, which I consider myself in this element as well. I just like to go places and learn about other people and how they do things. So I'm not even necessarily having anything to offer to them. They're offering everything to me. But that's something that I find um, beneficial and something that I'm interested in. So I'm also a cultural enthusiast as well. Next slide, please. And then lastly, the elements that living culture actually does or helps to do it, it acknowledges cultural communities and practitioners as valuable members of contemporary society. So like I said, when you're talking American Indian heritage here in Rhode Island, it's not something you just pick up and read in a book when you're interested on the topic. And then when you're done with it, you put it back on the book and you go back to your regular life. Roger Williams University is located on Metacomet Avenue. Who was Metacomet? You know, Patumtuck's down the road. What is Patumtuck? Um, you know, all of these place names are around us on an everyday basis here in Rhode Island, Mesquamacate, Narragansett. All of these names, do we even think about who they came from and where those people are? Because, you know, um, Oscar Quasin, hello, we're right here. We're around you on an everyday basis. So when you, when you look at things from a living culture perspective, you're acknowledging that these things are a part of contemporary society. They're at play right now as we talk to each other. What it also does is create space for relationship building and understanding because once you give that acknowledgement, then naturally as human beings, we say, well, wait a minute, what is my relationship with these things? What is my experience? If I'm here in Rhode Island, why don't I know about these people? Why don't I know about these culture? And that creates the space even the opportunity to explore these, 
these different avenues. And that's a lot of times what we're missing, even the creation of the space to do those sorts of things. You know, as human beings, once you realize that there's potential, the mind goes to, to all sorts of places you never even think. So it creates space for that. And then very importantly, it mitigates against colonial marginalization. One of the key things they did, particularly here to Narragansett people, was they told everyone we weren't real Indians anymore. We had too much, quote unquote, Negro blood, as if working with populations that had been enslaved and supporting them was something to be ashamed of. So when you, when you get into living culture, it mitigates against that whole narrative around what an Indian is supposed to look like, where they do exist, that the fact that they're supposed to have a certain amount of Indian blood to be legitimate. All of these things, when you look at things from a living culture perspective, you start to realize how foolish they are. And you start to realize that all of us on some level, no matter how hard we work, because we're still living in a colonial society, are colonized, and all of us have an immediate and consistent job to make sure that we're decolonizing ourselves, doing away with these narratives that have been pushed on us and understanding that there is so much more to the world than what we currently understand and even know about. And we need to be constantly working towards expanding our own knowledge. Next slide, please. So just want to talk about a couple of things as I close out first. This is a fantastic initiative that PCEI is working on and we are inviting everyone, all stakeholders, all individuals to be a part of it. Real Revolution 2036. And what Real Revolution 2036 is, is a multi-phase, statewide, regionally based marketing, branding, and cultural placemaking initiative. Our goal is to establish a unique statewide cultural tourism framework and infrastructure that's intended to attract and sustain cultural tourists in anticipation of and beyond Providence's 400th year commemoration in 2036. So we're about 16 years out which to me is fantastic because it means we've got 16 years to plan and get it right. Um, and this is actually modeled off of the fantastic they worked it up, the work they did on Massachusetts around the Plymouth 400 um, celebration. So they started 10 years ago, building relationships, talking about what they were going to do, um, and then uh, developing international partnerships uh, to draw an international tourism crowd to Plymouth to celebrate the 400th year anniversary. Unfortunately, COVID really did a number on it. But what we're saying is no need to reinvent the wheel. Let's just take that same strategy and then add even more time onto it to make sure our celebration's even better. Um, and it honors the three major aspects of Rhode Island's revolutionary legacy. First of all, the colonial aspect is Rhode Island being the catalyst for the American Revolution. Everyone talks about um, you know, the, the tea party and all that sort of stuff, and they dump tea. Uh, but then they also dressed up in India, as Indians to hide their identity when they did that. Well, here in Rhode Island with Gatsby Day, they didn't do any of that. They got on ships and they went and took over the Gatsby, uh, you know, uh, imprisoned the captain. I think some people got shot or killed um, and pretty much started the American Revolution. But no one talks about that. Everyone takes that story up to Boston. Uh, so we're saying, no, Rhode Island was actually started the American Revolution. Rhode Island with Roger Williams was the start of European ideals of freedom of religion and freedom of speech. So Rhode Island should really be looked at as the epicenter or the catalyst for the American Revolution. When we flip over to the indigenous side, it's also the epicenter of American Indian resistance during the King Phillips War. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail, uh, but I'm sure you heard about it earlier from the Sagamore. The Narragansetts were involved in that. And I like to say that if Europeans don't win the King Phillips War, there is no America after that. The entire world is a whole different place if Europeans don't win the King Phillips War. And to my knowledge to date, it is the or one of the bloodiest wars per capita in US history. Um, so it is the epicenter of American Indian resistance during the King Phillips War. Providence was actually burnt to the ground. Several other towns and villages were burnt to the ground. A lot of the major battles were fought here in the state. And once again, if King Phillips War isn't won, then there is no America after that. And then lastly, the third element that it honors is the cultural history of Rhode Island and Providence, particularly as a bastion of innovation, that's just say innovation and diversity. Um, if you're talking about the cotton gin, um, if you're talking, like I said, freedom of speech, if you're talking about the fact that Roger Williams' own people didn't accept him, but the Indians did, all of these elements combine to make Rhode Island the real revolution. And once again, we're targeting Providence's 400 year commemoration. Next slide, please. 
Uh, within that, our flagship initiative is Meshantiket, the tale of Maswaskit. Maswaskit is the original name for the lands between the Moshasic River and the Wanaskwetucket River, what we now today call Providence. So Meshantiket, the tale of Maswaskit is our flagship initiative for real revolution. It's a mixed reality quest-based cultural tourism product where uh, individuals will download an app and then they will actually go to locations where specific uh, villages were at and do an overlay sort of system, engage in a quest-based um, tourism sort of uh, uh, engagement there where they'll have to answer questions, have to go engage with things. And it's just a really cool concept. So it's founded in the principles of cultural equity and sustainable cultural heritage tourism. And it's meant to be a testament to Rhode Island's indigenous past and heritage that acknowledges and engages these communities once again as a thriving part of the vibrant fabric of Rhode Island's contemporary living culture. Next slide, please. And then, uh, as Brian already spoke about, uh, out of this and a part of this is also the Wuchiwami Living Culture Collaborative. So I'll let Brian speak more about that. Uh, but last slide, please, Brian. Um, this is just the work of the Providence Cultural Equity Initiative. So if you're interested in knowing more about us, uh, if you have, want to get in touch with us specifically, hello at propcei.org. You can check out our website, propcei.org. We're very active on Facebook, Providence CEI, or on Instagram, Prov CEI. Um, and you can also catch us at Living Culture RI, which is where we're most active. Uh, but just in the language of our people, Katapatus, Wuchia Tusuta, thank you for listening. And I'll turn the uh, the stage and the spotlight back over to Brian. Thank you, Ray. Um, I won't go too much more into uh, Wichiwami. What I would just say is that you know, if um, if you're looking to find a way to kind of plug into um, some of our planning, um, I would say reach out to Ray, reach out to Jeremy, reach out to Charlotte, reach out to myself. I think we'd be happy to get you into our working group. We'd be happy to start. I'm really big on not just community engaged teaching, but I'm big on interdisciplinary teaching. So I love partnering with folks in other classes, having our students work simultaneously or across semesters together to make really cool projects happen. Because I, as a writing teacher, although some of my expertise can extend into the digital realm, there are limits to what I can do. And I need to work with folks who are doing stuff, cool stuff with web development or cool stuff with history or cool stuff with all these other areas, right? Engineering, architecture, and I think um, the more you learn about our sort of mission and vision for this, I think you'll realize there's a lot of opportunity to plug in. Um, but I will say that, you know, um, that first conversation that I was having with Ray that was supposed to be about sort of how do we figure out a land acknowledgement that became about something much bigger, I was immediately saying, like, how do I get my class to plug into the work you're doing with PCEI? Like, you got to let me um, partner up, have my students maybe work on developing some of that web-based content that will be part of that augmented reality experience. So if what we're going to do is recontextualize and rename places and give a not only a history, but a sort of living culture sort of lesson for folks that's interactive as they make their way around Rhode Island that centers indigenous experiences and perspectives, but maybe also tells the history of other waves of immigrant communities and the kind of culture that they bring to the place. That's the kind of experience we wanna create. Um, but I think that what we have to do um, is ask our students, and this goes back to a point that a lot of folks have made, but I think Ray made really eloquently, is we have to acknowledge the way in which our current ways of thinking have been colonized, right? And we have to begin to decolonize those. And I think centering other people is part of it, but there's another part of it that's just really critically examining our own ways of knowing, our own ways of seeing, our own ways of valuing. And so what I wanted to sort of foreground here today is not, um, uh, you know, how do you do a community engaged teaching partnership, right? Um, but what are some like ways in which we can um, draw some sort of decolonial um, thinking and teaching principles and put them into our classroom um, and utilize those to get our students to really reflect um, on their own sort of epistemologies um, and their own ways of sort of navigating spaces. Um, so the first one I'm going to say a little bit about is counter storytelling, because this is something that came up in um, my discussion with Ray that, you know, really this whole um, idea of an augmented reality cultural tourism kind of quest experience is a kind of counter story. Um, and so this idea, um, this goes back to uh, Delgado back in the 80s, right? He's talking about counter stories as enriching the imagination and teaching that by combining elements 
from a story and current reality, we can imagine new realities that aren't even possible, right? We challenge received wisdom. Um, we engage our conscience as in the way that only storytelling can, right? Um, make us question our own beliefs. Show us that there are whole other ways of believing that make um, the ways that we might think are the only way to believe kind of foolish, right? Um, and allow us to then sort of question the ethics, right, that make us sort of complicit in um, perpetuating injustice. Um, so those are the sort of basic parameters of counter storytelling. There's all sorts of ways in which you can tell a counter story. Um, the one way I'm going to share with you is the one that's sort of come out of critical race theorists. And the idea is that um, through your primary research, which can involve actual like human subjects research, right? Um, or other kinds of research with primary documents as you might do in your um, core classes. Um, and then secondary research where you're reading scholarship on these things, um, including your own personal and professional experiences. I think especially if you are a black indigenous or other person of color, right? That personal experience can really matter in sort of in different ways than being a white student or faculty. But I think, you know, embracing the fact that um, of our own whiteness and how that's informed by sort of settler colonial mentality, right, is really important as well too. Um, ultimately, we do this in order to create like composite characters that we place into dialogue, right? Um, and we do these characters with an understanding that our identities are complex, right? So always we're understanding race and racism as a lens, but we're thinking about things like gender, um, we're thinking about things like class, um, we want to create a story that really challenges some dominant way of thinking um, that's committed to enacting some other way of approaching the world through a social justice lens. Um, and it's this idea that we don't, and we don't have to lend, um, lean on one particular disciplinary way of approaching this either. Um, so some examples of how you can kind of do this. Here's one, um, and I think there's all sorts of ways in which you can kind of play with this prompt. So this is not at all like the end all be all but as an example of something you can do, right? So based on your own, under this is something you might show students, right? Based on your own understanding of history, especially indigenous history and living culture, and what you know about your own family history, write a counter story that challenges enduring colonial ways of seeing ourselves, others in the world. To do so, consider who your family was before their identities were shaped by the colonization of America. What might they be like today if they were never touched by colonization here or elsewhere? If colonization never even happened? Now create a composite character of who you might have become in that alternate reality um, and write a dialogue in which you, as you are here and now, have a conversation with that character. Um, what stories would you tell each other about yourselves, your alternate realities, and their alternate histories? How would your identities, experiences, and ways of seeing inform the questions you ask and the lessons you teach and learn from one another? So this is not supposed to be a less, uh, an exercise in which um, we imagine, especially our predominantly white sort of student population, that they sort of imagine a, a world in which they're absolved of their complicity and colonization. But it is a way of shifting maybe the way in which they understand each other themselves now to sort of reflect on ways in which they can't even examine their own positionality within this culture. They can't even see how they are operating from a colonized perspective. There's another version of this that I've thrown up here. Um, where instead you're focusing on a particular location. Um, so this could be, for instance, the, um, the address of it. It could be our university's campus, right? Um, this could be the street where you grew up in, the town you grew up in, um, you know, where, however you want to think about it, but not to get so much bigger that it loses context. Write a counter story that challenges enduring colonial ways of seeing ourselves, others in the world, again, but in this case, you're imagining what that location might have been like before it was shaped by the colonization of America. Who would have grown up in that location and be there currently? And how would they talk to you now as someone who maybe knows a lot about that place, but experienced it in an alternative way? So that's counter storytelling, okay? One version of it in creating this dialogue between characters um, that experience the world differently. Um, another sort of term I wanna throw at you all is this idea of epistemic delinking. And this is something that we've been um, talking about actually kind of this whole, um, this whole uh, little webinar, right? Um, faculty development webinar. That the idea here is that, um, so we are trying to create epistemic shifts in how we understand things. So we're not no longer only seeing things through a decolonial lens, right? We have new ways of knowing the world. 
Um, and that leads to um, whole new ways of thinking about political possibilities, economic possibilities. And I think you see that in Ray's vision for the Providence Cultural Equity Initiative, that it's really bringing ideas about politics, history, economy, um, all through together through this lens of shifting our cultural lens, right? Um, and the way we do that is through interrogating terms that have maybe been anchored in um, a colonial way of understanding things. So this can even be things like economic development, right? What does economic development mean when we shift to a decolonial lens? But it can be also be things like sovereignty and recognition and these ideas. What does it mean to be a sovereign indigenous person, right? Can we think about sovereignty through a lens that's not a colonial lens of sovereignty? Um, so this sort of links back to some of the readings you did here, and that's where I'm pulling this from uh, Scott Richard Lyon's work on rhetorical sovereignty, that you know um, we have to really sort of learn how to think outside of the way in which these terms are sort of already loaded, and that we don't even question what they mean, right? So how do we make that shift? And I think we begin to interrogate sort of their roots. Um, so thinking about this through a sort of delinking Rhode Island place names, right? What names have been um, displaced and replaced by other names, right? And what's lost in that? Um, what names, when we see something called Metacomet Avenue, has no contextualization, right? And needs to be recontextualized for folks. Um, so that's the kind of question I'm raising here. And the examples I'm showing here is, you know, what work do we have to do to recontextualize our campus, um, potentially rename locations on our campus, and potentially question even the values that we associate with Roger Williams, right? Things like civility, right? Um, so that's one of my favorite ones. Um, but I also show here these ideas that we need to reframe what we think of as Mount Hope. Uh, we might have, want to question sort of the roles that institutions play in, um, in controlling land and controlling naming, controlling contextualization. So an example here that I want to give you um, for delinking place, um, again, so it's that based on your understanding of indigenous history and living culture, um, that to me is an invitation to you as an instructor to um, try to provide some adequate foundation for your students, right, to begin to do this work. Um, uh, choose a particular, um, you know, street name, right, uh, university campus, um, and provide some context make a proposal to the relevant stakeholders to say, um, we need to find a way to communicate to the public um, a different way to name this place or recognize the history and living culture of indigenous peoples in this area. Uh, the last thing I just wanna lead you with, because I think that some of this can be really intimidating for those of us um, who might be cultural enthusiasts, but might not be experts, right, in indigenous um, culture or history. Um, that you know, one of the things we're not trying to do is necessarily turn our students into experts either, right? And we're certainly not supposed to be creating opportunities in which they imagine what it would be like if they were an indigenous person, right? Um, so I say that as we work with our students to center indigenous people, voices, and perspectives, we can't ask them to pretend to be indigenous, right? Um, what centering indigeneity does is ask us and our students to decenter our own identities, our own epistemologies, and our own ethics just long enough that we can critically examine them and ask like, are those even working for us? Because a lot of times they're not, right? So we can think about it as a somewhat selfless or self-centered enterprise. Like this allows us to reflect on ourselves, but it also allows us to appreciate others in a different way as well. So the point here is to put ourselves into the position of being non-experts, right? And in that work, as we pursue it further and get deeper into it, um, we can be mindful about how those things impact indigenous communities and how we want to center them more in our work. Um, with that, I want to make sure we had enough time. What do we have? About 20 minutes, um, not just for Q&A with um, Ray and I, although I hope you'll you know, have some good questions for Ray. I'm sure he'd be happy to answer them. Um, that you might be able to ask um, folks who might have stuck around from our previous sessions or even Jeremy and Charlotte anything you have about taking the knowledge uh, you gained today um, or the confusions that have arisen for, for you throughout these last few hours, um, the challenges you feel like you're encountering in the way you're thinking about this, like I think now is an opportunity for us to kind of discuss the whole kit and caboodle um, if you would like. So Brian, I'll share just a few thoughts. Um, I think 
the best way I can present it, because I really like what you just said about not being afraid to be a non-expert and not being afraid to, to do self-reflection um, to see if your own understanding or norms and things of that nature are actually even what you yourself at this point in life buy into or, 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 or feel you should be. The best example I can give is, and I'll take it right back to that pyramid of the sun picture I took. Whenever you go somewhere as a cultural tourist, and that's going somewhere specifically to visit a place that you can't find anywhere else in the world because it's tied to these people and you have an interest in that. That's exactly what you transform into when you get there. When we pulled up into the lot and you see this humongous pyramid right there at that very moment, I say to myself, I don't know anything about this. I need to learn about this. So when I engage with that space, I'm engaging from the standpoint of being a non-expert and being really excited to be a non-expert at this place because it means I'm not gonna overlook the individual details and nuances that if I thought I already knew it, I might. So that's ultimately what I think we're, we're encouraging everyone to do. If you've ever done, done any sort of tourism like that, where you went to a place because it had that there, you can't go anywhere else in the world, you're not those people, but you're really interested in those people and how they do things, we're asking you to adopt and employ that same sort of mindset here in these lands, because that's what, in my opinion, our people should be. Um, you wouldn't go to, I don't know, anywhere that you're not from, hopefully, and present yourself as if you're the expert there and how they do things and they should be doing things the way that you think. It, you wouldn't do that. But when we live here in the U.S., amongst Nahigansets, Poconokets, Nipmucks, that's very much how the engagement is, as if in our own lands, other people are the experts and we should be fitting into that box. So I'm asking everyone, and this is why I, I, I encourage cultural tourism, that's why I'm promoting the cultural economy and all that, because we've all, or most of us, I would imagine, have at some point done that, been excited to be the non-expert so that you make sure not to miss the nuances and details and to get the full story and to fill in the areas that you don't understand Employ that here in Rhode Island, and I promise you, if you do that, you will be blown away by the treasure trove of historical experiences and narratives that, like I said earlier, influence and inform or have influenced and have informed the world right here in this little state called Rhode Island. And I'm excited around this cultural stuff because if I could be supremely bold, as Brian said, really thinking big. I think right now with everything that's going on with COVID, with how all of this, everything's in, in flux right now, we could be on you know, the brink of doing it again through a cultural revolution by going back and sharing the history here and showing the world how you embrace, honor, respect, promote, acknowledge, all of those elements, cultural narratives in a way that can help lead to the future. I think a lot of times in the past, it's been commodified, um, it's been economized, but not to the benefit or in the interest of the people that are being economized and commodified. I think we've got a real chance here to proactively and intentionally figure this thing out in a manner that checks off all of the boxes that we want and encourages, I love what Brian said, being the non-expert. If we all go into this being proud to be the non-experts, you're going to have a fantastic experience and really learn some, some excellent, excellent things that that will really, I think, change your life and your perspective on things. My rambling, I'm sorry I do that. No, I do thank you, Ray. I want to, oh, sorry, oh, Charlotte. I really add that even people who, um, you know, have studied New England for most of their adult lives have so much to learn uh, and, and relearn. Uh, and I consider one, one of my, myself that person too. So it's just non, not just non-subject specialists. I think even historians who've studied New England for so long really need to kind of be quiet and listen to these new perspectives. So I just wanted to add that. I can see that there's a question in the chat that I presume you're going to address, Ryan. Yeah. So I want to, I want to toss this to Ray. Um, like I, and I said in the chat, I sort of have my opinion on this, but it goes back to a uh, a method of teaching that I think you know a lot of folks have found really valuable um, at, at Roger, and it's that 
um, that idea of sort of historical enactment, right? Where you ask students to um, take on the sort of character of a particular historical figure in a particular moment, right? Um, learn what it would be like to perform that person's role in that particular important historical scene, right? Um, and I think one of the, I think one of the challenges um, that folks have been thinking about lately is, you know, can you ask a student to, um, who is not an indigenous person, right, to play the role, can, can a white student pretend they're King Philip, right, um, in, a, in, an, in an historical reenactment? And I'd, I'd be interested to know what you think about that, Ray. And maybe, and, um, and maybe Sagamore, if you would like to maybe comment after that, I'd be interested to hear what you have to say. Yeah, so I'll answer first, then I'll turn over to Sagamore. I'm going to say a, a very certain no, and you shouldn't do that. What's wonderful about him in Rhode Island, right, is that the gentleman you just spoke to descends from King Philip. So there's no need to go and play him. You can reach out to that community and ask that community themselves what they think. You can ask someone from that community if they'd be interested in participating. So that's the real potential and the opportunity that's here in Rhode Island. All of these histories that we're talking about that Charlotte just spoke about, those people are still here. We're still here. I descend from both Canonicus and my antinomy. So if you're talking about what was going on in that time, we're still here. Lorette, you know, these people are still here. You don't have to pretend. You don't have to do that. You have tremendous resources that you can tap into. So no, don't reenact and pretend you are um, what's the saying? The, 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 the path to hell is paved with the best of intentions. Yeah, don't do that. You'll probably make a local Indian really upset. It might be embarrassing. It's not the energy that you want. But on the flip side, you have these communities right here that you can engage with. Yes. Yes, you do. And, you know, one of the important things to remember about history is that's his story. They lied about the history. All right. Uh, to be a member of the Poconoco tribe, which was the headship tribe of the nation, you have to be from one of the lines, that, uh, uh, you have to be, be either from the Massasoit's line, you have to be from Anawan's line, who was the Massasoit's brother-in-law, or you have to be from Amy's line, who was the uh, Massasoit's sister, uh, 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 you know, King Philip's sister. You have to come, or Corner Corner, who was, so in other words, you have to come from one of those lines in order to be from that Poconoka tribe, see? So basically, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, being the headship of that tribe and of this area here, why would you have to go to someone else to ask about our history? They don't engage us in our history. Don't forget, there were other tribes in our nation, but they weren't, they were of the Poconoke Nation. They were not of the Poconoke tribe. The Poconoke tribe was the headship of that whole nation. So. The, uh, the Pacassets, the uh, Namaskit, the, the uh, uh, Asanswa, all of these, uh, uh, the Asanic, all of those, those were tribes in our nation. But the Poconoke tribe was uh, 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 dwelled in Psalms, and that tribe was all of the Massasoit's direct relatives. All right, so in other words, you had to be from that line in order to be Poconoke tribe. Yeah, thank you, Sagamore. I mean, I think one of the important things I'm drawing from listening to others is that these, um, these lineages of communicating sort of the knowledge, right, uh, that's associated with identity and culture, right, is such a, um, a vital and um, an, an important part of um, what I've learned from being, um, be getting able to interact with the Sagamore, getting to interact with Ray, that like, I feel like creating these kinds of um, uh, circumstances, right, in which we ask a student to maybe pretend what that would be like, it's almost sort of dishonoring the complexity that goes around along with maybe imagining what it means to live within that identity. Um, I, there's a question up here about um, the, the Lions article. So, um, which was, uh, you know, the, I would encourage folks if you, if you ever have a chance to read a little bit, the, the longer sort of version of that, because I think he goes a little bit more into this, but the question is sort of like, how do we, um, how do we um, sort of, uh, well, I'll just read it. Can you say more about writing as a colonial technology of oppression and how we might reconcile asking students to use writing to question the very thing Lyons argues writing contributes to? And one of the things that I think Lyons says is, let's not be so fast to um, essentialize um, and exoticize uh, American Indian folks to imagine that 
um, that writing is not a tool that they are exercising their own sort of uh, sovereign capacity to communicate who they are, how they know, and what they want to accomplish. So I think that, um, and one of the things he does at the end is he sort of critiques ways um, in which maybe certain folks have um, framed that, right? As, um, you know, that, uh, that, um, that um, American Indian, Native American Indigenous folks um, are, are primarily an oral tradition folk, right? And that, and that we, we can adopt those oral ways of thinking as a way of sort of indigenizing the way we think. And I think he says that that's sort of racist and essentialist, right? And, and that when we look at the way that indigenous folks have used, have operated within an oppressive system, and yet have really um, done incredible things to use that system to their advantage, despite the way it's being used against them, we have to really question, right? does that tool belong to the colonizer anymore? Or do we need to really think about how it's been, um, uh, it's been taken up and transformed into something different, right, within that context? I don't know if you want, Ray, do you want to say anything more about that sort of idea about how, you know, um, uh, essentializing or even that, um, the way in which maybe we um, make simplistic distinctions between what counts as sort of traditionally indigenous right or what how we think about indigenous folks today yeah so i think that speaks to the specificity and the diversity amongst indigenous populations so most times when people think about quote unquote indians immediately your mind's going to go out to the northern plains and you're going to look for the big headdresses and you're going to look for the horses and you're going to look for the buffalo hunting and all that and that's all beautiful culture but that was not here in the northeast we were woodland people so I think that any attempt to kind of simplify indigenous culture is always going to get you in a bad spot because the indigenous cultures were not the same simply based upon their environment. When you get into New England region, the dialect switched every 50 miles or so. It was all still southeastern New England Algonquian, but different terms had different meanings. So the, the, the example I like to give is, in Niagansa, they say Wunikisa, which is good day. But in Massachusetts, they say Kisuk Wunigan. So Kisuk being day, Wuni being good, but they're switched. Now, of course, because I know what Wuni and I know what Kisuk means, if I was talking to someone who was speaking, I'd still know what they meant, but was speaking different sorts of slang. And if you think about it, the same thing goes on in contemporary society. Some people say cool, some people say wicked, some people say awesome all different terms to designate the same sort of concept. So when you try to simplify indigenous culture, imagine trying to do that with European culture. Oh, Europe, what do you mean European? Are you talking French? Are you talking English? Are you talking, so you know, we have a, once again, and that's part of the colonization, treating indigenous cultures as if it's less complex, less comprehensive, something lesser other than what we consider to be the norm. And when you look at the histories of what was going on, the political games that were being played, the way people were maneuvering, why treaties were signed, it's every bit of engaging as politics are today. It was just with different people. So I think anytime you try to simplify anything, but particularly indigenous culture, you're going to get yourself in trouble. Once again, there is no simplifying. Take the non-expert role. I don't know anything, so I can't simplify. I need to understand as much as I can about everything individually to get to the comprehensive picture. And if we take that route, then we'll understand why the Pocono could sign a peace treaty with the Pilgrims in the first place. Why the Narragansett stayed out of the King Philip's War for so long. Why the Niantics were allowed to continue on after the war the way that they did. There was no individual sort of, I mean, um, no general sort of indigenous experience here. There is no general culture here. Pequots weren't originally from this region. That'll let you know what was going on in the Pequot Wars in 1638 and why the Narragansetts teamed up with the colonists. You have to look at things individually. You have to look at them comprehensively. You have to give them all their individual and proper respect. Do not try to generalize any indigenous culture. You will get yourself into trouble every time. Yeah, you know, I want to. I want to mention this. Like, there's a there's a movement in technical communication. You know, back in the '90s, which you know, intercultural communication during that time was very much. Um, let's identify the different cultural ways specific cultures across the world right communicate 
Um, and it became these really essentialized sort of things, right? Um, and it didn't really help anybody because all of this was a bulleted list, right? That was not, that had no context. Um, and so the field really shifted to, what we really want to do is teach students critically to think about who they are when they enter into a situation, right? And also what they might assume about a particular people and how to learn through relating with folks, right? Um, a little bit more about them, right? So it's a, it's a sort of anti-essentialist thing. And it reminds me that my, uh, my colleague, Dr. Iris Ruiz, who does work in uh, sort of decolonial theory and rhetoric and composition, I mean, she says, you know, decolon decolonial sort of approaches to what we're doing are about sort of unlearning and relearning, right? How to learn. <laughs> like, and so that's really what we're talking about. It's like, so, you know, not so much like here are the eight points that you need to teach your students about Narragansett culture, but how do we unlearn how we thought about our indigenous um, neighbors and how do we relearn how to learn about them is really what the kind of work that we're trying to do. Can I, can I interject, Brian? Thank you. And, and Ray, thank you. Those are great responses. I, I was the one that answer, asked that question. And, and that, that really clarifies some things. I guess I, what I'm curious about, though, because I think Lyons brings up this really interesting point about technology in general and using technology as a tool of colonialism and then how to decolonize technologies that have become so embedded in our society, especially a literate mindset, right? So certainly there's no, there's no inherently better... Uh, uh, it, it's not inherently better to be literate over oral, right? That's not, you know, I'm just wondering how do we, especially when the university depends so much on a tool like writing, how do we start to unpack that a little bit so we do make more space for oral ways of knowing, et cetera? Sure. Um, so I think one fantastic way, and I think is, is uh, take my hat off to the great work that Jeremy did with the, with the Poconoke family, is taking those oral experiences and traditions as far as that community or that culture is willing to share and working with them to narrate it or write it down but in the manner that they think is appropriate to the sagamore's point when they wrote about us in the past they wrote about us from their perspective so mm -hmm. we were savages that were extincted and that was their perspective and everything flowed from how they initially wrote about us as savages but then you have to ask yourself, well, if they were savages, then why were you signing treaties with them? You don't sign treaties with savages. So if you had been telling it from the indigenous standpoint, that narrative is very, very different. And if it's told from the indigenous standpoint, and if the narrative is different from the beginning, then hundreds of years later, the perspective on those people is different. But they say that the conqueror always gets to tell the story. Right. So let's rethink that story that the conqueror told and let's work with whatever is there, be it oral, um, be it through crafts, whatever it is, and let's look at narrating and writing those experiences and those histories from that perspective. Once again, the non-expert. So I don't know what happened. I heard about what happened, but I don't know. Let me ask these people and then let me take these people at their word that this is what took place. So when the Poconoke say there was a Poconoke nation, they were trying to rally people together, King Philip was, and that's where Wampanoag came from, and that's why you have Wampanoag today. Let's not argue from a colonial perspective, well, that's not what I heard, or that, but let's say, okay, <laughs> that's what happened. Let's tell the story that way. And then what you'll find is, and I'll turn over to the Sagamore after this, there's gonna be other historians out there who were gonna tell it the way that the Sagamore did because not every historian back then was in the business of trying to co-opt the story and trying to tell it in a way that was beneficial to Euro colonization. A lot of them were like, hey, wait a minute. That's not what happened. This is what happened. You shouldn't be writing like that. And a lot of them lost their careers behind that or had their works shoved off in the, in the National Library and hid way in the back of the, <laughs> so it's mm -hmm. out there when we decide to give the other perspective a fair shot and, and the benefit of the doubt. Sagamore. Yeah, so, and I, I can say, you know, oration was the only tool that we had to prove who we were. And so as far as the United States government was concerned, that is just as credible as your written history. Uh, uh, when we went to, uh, we were applying for federal recognition, this is back in the 1890s before we realized that wasn't the way to go. We had a, a docent who worked for the Heffern Refugee Museum, and uh, her name was Susan Eason. 
she was doing a thesis on a doctrine. And we told her how my mother's people were taken from Mount Hope to the Chautauqua Reservation. She had access to this information because she was doing a thesis at Brown University and that information was in the John Brown Library. We have access to that, but this was the oration that was passed on to us, how my mother's people got up into Connecticut, that sign in the line. My grand, most of my grandparents were born in the 1860s and 1870s. I mean, I'm in my 78th year on this year, so I'll forget more that I remember, let me put it to you that way. But when my grandmother, who was uh, born in what, 1878, and they said she was like maybe three, four years old when she came, when they came in to register her, which probably, she was still alive in the 1970s. And so she, when she tells me with her own lips, my people come from Anawan. You know where Anawan Rock is? The time that I can remember. But my, my, not only did she tell me, she told my wife and my grand and my uh, my children this story. So you know, I, I remember saying to my mother, uh, you know, my Indian heritage has done has has done anything for me because when they when they what they did to Poconoke, they didn't to, to, to the Poconoke tribe, not the nation. They were exporting our people. Uh, taking us out of this country. This is the beginning of the slave trade. They was taking us out of here in the 1600s if you were Poconoke. And if they could, and if you couldn't, uh, if you were Poconoke, like I said, at that time they kill you. And then they were bringing, they was taking us to the Caribbean as far away as the Azores, the Madeira Islands. And I'll tell you a little story about the name Philip and uh, and uh, uh, warm, uh, warm Sutter's Alexander. Uh, when you're talking about uh, religion, uh, the English thought heathen, not, they, they, and they thought of the Greek as heathen. So that's why when they petitioned for name, the English courts for name, they gave the name Philip, uh, Philip of, of uh, Alexander, and they gave Warm Sutter the name uh, Alexander, but Alexander the Great, because the English thought the Greeks were heathen also. So that's how, this is the stories that were passed down to us in our family. My grandmother, my father's uh, uh, mother, come from the Aldican line. That's that, that's that Seekonk tribe today that they had to recognize as a Seekonk Indian because they couldn't, even in, even in, in the year 2000 that was still on the books, uh, you couldn't say you were Poconoke. So in my time coming up, it just wasn't fashionable, but my family was known as the real Indians. That princess that you see on that mural downtown providence that's my mother's first cousin princess red wing that's that mural that's like three stories high on the building downtown that's that was our last chief she was recognized as the chief council uh, by the council of chiefs uh, uh, on the east coast here uh, chief of poconoke so i mean these are stories that were passed down to us but i remember susan easton she went back she was a docent at the heifer ref museum and she told those people these people have information that no one knows about. And she found it in the John Brown Library. She said, if I wasn't, if I didn't have access to that, then I could, but that's how we did our, that's how we did our petition for federal recognition from oration. And everything that our parents and the grandparents told us was true. So, so that's, you know, that that's all I could tell you about oration. That's all we had. We didn't have a written language. That might yeah. jump in too now and just say that when, um, it, in, in my class, the Decolonizing the Land class, which was an anthropology and honors um, co-listed course in the spring, COVID threw us for a loop, but um, you know, we very intentionally, um, as, as Ray saying, and as Brian saying, and Sagmar saying, um, wanted to unlearn, right, the, the settler colonial. So we had to do a lot of that early on, right, and, and center um, unlearning the colonial scripts, and then leaning into this sort of interested amateur position, right? And that's hard for me to do as an anthropologist, right? Who who knows, you know, how to take histories and think about eth eth ethnography and all the rest of it and then emerge as the expert, right? So so this journey that the students and I went on talking with the Sagamore, talking with the Sachem, and as he's alluding to here, right? The, the oral history needs to be valorized as, um, as evidence, right? Um, and Jen had had made a had made an aside in the in the chat about kind of how in the West we we grade evidence, right? Uh, materiality and uh, you know after the Newtonian revolution, materiality and objectivity and these kinds of 
ways of thinking and whether or not it gets into an archive, right, is another kind of level, right? Um, whereas oral history gets discounted. Well, we had to stare in the face of that tradition, flip it, right? But then also go to the archives, as Ray's saying, and find the proof, right, that can substantiate the, the oral history. It doesn't make the oral history any more true that it, that it has archival backup, but it helps, right, if it has archival backup. It's, it's true on itself because you believe this tradition, right? You believe this tradition. If you understand racialization, if you understand how histories get pushed to the side, if you understand decolonial thinking, then you understand that this, you know, oral history, this oral tradition that has persisted, that has survived, um, has been, has done so despite all um, constant, um, you know, encouragement to, to see the exit, right? And so, so we have to center that, you have to valorize that. And then if you find, as we did, and it came into this book, I, I want to show you the book because I know you've read it. We have 5,000 copies of this because we've got a fantastic grant to do it. So you, you guys are going to all receive this. I hope you use it in your classes. I hope, um, I hope you give it to your students um, because this is part of getting that story out there. And it's, it's an unlearning at the same time that it's a learning. It's an iterative, recursive process, and it needs to be guided with humility and ethics, right? Um, which is all, I think, uh, what, what we're all saying in the piece. So I'm going to shut up again. And with that, I know we're, we're over time, right? So um, I don't know if, uh, if folks, how we want to wrap things up here. Jeremy, do you, uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Not a one. <laughs> um, I'm just overjoyed that um, you all stuck it out this long, that there was such interest. You know, uh, some people came, came and went, but I think we had 32, 33 participants. There were an additional 15 who couldn't make it, right? So that's, that's a quarter of the faculty, right? Uh, something like that, right? Um, so it, whether it's a Rogers seminar class or it's um, just something that you want to be as a, as a you know, well-informed citizen, able to speak to, able to pass on references and resources to your students, able to invite them into unlearning things and being humble and being curious, right? Not playing Indian, but instead reaching out to Ray, reaching out to the Sagamore, right? And, and I know that that can be an intimidating kind of proposition, right? But um, 400 years is long enough of, of for physical conquest and then this kind of epistemic conquest as well. Um, we're three. We're three miles away from Patumtuck, right? We're on land that was not ceded or sold or bartered or any kind of way, and and that history matters. So how can we think in terms of landscape architecture, in terms of how our classes are are taught, in terms of Indigenous Peoples Day, in terms of land acknowledgement, in terms of building structures like the the um, the uh, real revolution, right? That go forward and and connect our land and our work on it to these people as opposed to footnoting it or as opposed to just recreating this you know the, the lies that that rob people's histories from them um and and they're present you know again it's living culture right so so i just think we've got a wealth of, of resources it's been fantastic to be able to connect with the sagamore with the sachem with the loren with ray um we have a lot of work to do too so i think we just have to be grateful for this space to work together Charlotte, do you have any uh, final thoughts? Well, my British timekeeping uh, means that we really need to wrap up. It's nine minutes past. Um, so I just want to reiterate what you said, both Jeremy and Brian, uh, and say that it's been a real privilege to sit here and learn from, from everybody this morning. And I look forward to continuing that learning. So thank you. Yes, thanks all for coming. And especially thank you to our, um, our honored guests who, who uh, led um, all of our three sessions. Thank you. Can I just jump in quickly um, to thank everybody um, for participating and to thank so much to um, our organizers and our guests. Um, this was really, really um, a great way to transition from summer thinking to, um, to um, you know, sharing this endeavor of, of looking forward to a new academic uh, year. I did want to advertise that um, we are, you know, we're going to be really serious about this kind of learning this year. And so I'm glad to announce that you'll be hearing soon about a new series that we're launching um, that's gonna be sponsored by Academic Affairs, um, which we're calling um, uh, Hidden Truths, Stories of Race and Place. This is gonna be a series of um, uh, virtual uh, talks that um, 
Um, Laura Diamore is taking the lead in organizing. And so be on the lookout for, adver you know, for um, notices about that. These are going to be recorded um, virtual um, interventions that we're going to invite different um, stakeholders and community members to deliver. Um, we're looking forward to this as something that you can be including in your classes as part of your content um, that you can be working on, you know, for our own um, community building and um, um, faculty uh, development. Um, and so uh, you'll be hearing more about the specifics of that soon. We're going to go heavy in the fall and then uh, additionally have some more moments in the in the spring. And so um, just one more, you know, one more chance to say thank you to everybody. And um, I'm really glad uh, to have this initial um, strong uh, uh, and, and really powerful um, move in this work that we're going to do together to, um, to, to be a university that's doing the work that needs to be done. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you, you Jason. Much. Thank you, Jason, for your support, the support of your office. Thank you, Alan Hans, the Associate Provost for Community Engagement, for the support of your office. We'll definitely be looking for um, more information about that Hidden Story series. Uh, if anyone's interested in Wichiwami, the Living uh, Culture Collaborative, you can get in touch with any of the organizers. You can get in touch with Brett. You can get in touch with Sue Bosco uh, from the Provost's office, Ray. Um, you know, uh, any, anyone really, um, if you have any questions at all, we're going we're gonna to share out the chat. I'm going to save the chat. We're also going, we have been recording. So with the permission of our honored guests, um, we will make that available somehow, probably internally, uh, maybe via YouTube. Um, but, uh, you know, we've got a lot of rich uh, information here. So I want to kind of archive it. I know you're probably interested in that. So we'll, we'll be sending it on. You have the links to the slides. Use those. Those are, you know, hyperlinks. So there's a lot of stuff in there, too. Um, and let's uh, have a great semester. Plymouth 400, as Ray mentioned, right, um, is a lot of stuff is going online. Um, Indigenous Peoples Day is October 12th. It's a teaching day, right? So um, we're, we're not taking the day off. So don't take the day off. Don't, don't. I would encourage you not to, you know, take your eyes off the ball of what we're talking about here this morning um, and, and look for any information about a land acknowledgement. Put it in your syllabus. Talk about it. Talk through it, right? Um, so that we're changing the culture from the bottom up as well at Roger Williams University in the way that I think we all are dedicated to doing. So thank you all again, and we'll be in touch soon.